Don't forget to join our Ascension Day service this Thursday at 8 a.m. and at 6 p.m. with a night of prayer and power. Join us for our Pentecost conference from the 21st to the 26th of May at 6 p.m. and our night of praise and power on the 26th of May. Let us give people hope with Operation Hope. You are welcome to donate blanket, beanies and any tin food. The outreach will take place on the 17th of June. If you would like to be kept updated with services and events, please contact 079-520-2088. Sit back and enjoy the service. Right, how many of you remember that song from the 70s or 80s? All right, let's see who was around in the 70s and 80s, eh? All right. An amazing song done by Boney M. It was actually one of these reggae songs, and they took it, and uh, they just changed a couple of things. But where does that song come from? Psalm 137. You know, all the psalms were songs. And uh, the Jewish people would sing those psalms as we would read them. They would sing them. And here's a reggae group that would take a song or psalm and turned it into one of the most popular hits of the time. And let me read to you that psalm from Psalm 137. It says, By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down. Yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. We hung our harps upon the willows in the midst of it. For there those who carried us away captive asked of us a song. And those who plundered us requested mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget its skill. If I do not remember you, let my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth. If I do not exalt Jerusalem above my chief joy. This was a song that we find in a book of Psalms in our Bibles, written by someone who experienced what was going on in Babylon. Now remember, in about 580, the temple was burnt down and people were taken exile to Babylon. Now where's Babylon today? It's modern day Iraq. And this place that they referred to by the rivers was really the Euphrates River and the Tigris River. The same area in which the Garden of Eden was found. Isn't that amazing? In the middle of the desert, there was a garden called Eden. And this was, you know, Iraq plays such a great part in our Old Testament. People don't realize that. But this is the area that these Israel people, these Hebrew people found themselves. They were taken captive, and most of them were royalty that were taken captive. Because it was the lower part, the part of Judah, that was taken captive, and they were settled into desert area. And there we read, they hung up their harps. And that must have been pretty strange for the Babylonians, because the Babylonians knew that the Hebrew people were accustomed to worship, to singing. And still today, the Israelis, even though they're doing a bar mitzvah on a Thursday at the Wailing Wall, they'll be singing and they're joyful. And all of a sudden, the psalmist says, these people that were so joyful, that used to play music before the Lord, are now quiet. They've hung up their harps in the willow trees. And the willow trees, we know, is symbolic of weeping, depression. And so you have the whole Hebrew nation, not the whole Hebrew nation, but the lower part of Israel in depression. And they write these words that we know we've also put to song. But it's challenged me these last few days that often when circumstances are bad, and that's what happened with them, circumstances change. They were used to a good life. They were used to uh, the promised land. And all of a sudden, they were taken into a foreign country. And they didn't want to sing there. And isn't it strange? And this is where the challenge came to me these past few days. I was saying to the Lord, Lord, there have been often times when my circumstances have changed that you don't feel like worshiping the Lord. Who have you been like that? Can you relate to that? Yeah, you, you, you feel like quitting. You feel like just giving up. And I think these people, when they hung up their harps, it was a sign of them saying, I quit. That's it. Now I'll release myself to 
my lot. And what was that? 70 years in a foreign country. That was the consequences of their sin. They would have to live there 70 years. That's why they hung up their hops. They said, we'll never sing a song again. We'll never play to the Lord again. And I'm thinking, how many times haven't you and I been like that, hey? Things happen in our lives. We lose our job. We're faced with illness. We're faced with cancer. We're faced with this. We're faced with a marriage breaking down. We're faced with a business failing. And what do we do? We want to hang up our hops. Am I right? Or you don't get the promotion that has been promised to you. What happens? We say, that's it. There's no song in my heart anymore. And we allow the circumstances of the day to control our emotions and our feeling. I was saying to the earlier congregation this morning, I really didn't feel like being here this morning. And I thought, Lord, I'm going to phone Pastor Yan and say, Pastor Yan, you come and preach this morning. You look much better. You're much younger. You're more handsome. You preach well. So you come and preach. And I thought, no. God has given me an assignment. And this assignment is the word that I'm preaching to you. So it wouldn't have been right. And you see, that's what God will honor. He will honor your discipline. He will honor your obedience. He will honor you when you don't feel like doing things, that you do it. And these Hebrew people, they were looking for the easy way to cop out. That's it. I hang up my harp. Come on, how many of you have got to that place in your life? Marlene, it's always met your gebeur. You feel like, that's it. I can't even bid me, but it helped me. Of, I can't even worship me. The stuff you have on the Come on. You know what? Since, since I went deaf, the one thing that I miss is my worship. And I'll stand outside there and I'll still worship from my heart. Because you see, that's what God is looking for. He's looking for your praises regardless of your circumstances. Life isn't always easy, is it? But listen. The Bible says we are more than. Yes, mere as a word of honor. Come on, that's who you are. And it's when we break through, when we push through, when we say, God, I'm not prepared to hang up that harp, that's what God will honor in your life. Do I hear an amen here this morning? Hey? You see, and I look at this, 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 this psalm and I think to myself, how often has in the adversary the devil whispered in my ear, when things are not going the way I've planned them to go, and you'll say, then quit. Hang up your harp. And those are the same words he whispered into the Hebrew people's lives. You see, I want to remind you this morning of the title that I've given this message. Honey, what shrunk our problems? Can you remember the movie, Honey, Who Shrunk the Kids? Well, sometimes I think when my kids were growing up, I, I really prayed that, honey, what about shrinking the kids? But you see, praise, when we discipline ourselves to praise God, you know what happens? Our problems begin to shrink. Because we magnify God in such a way, we praise in God that all the negativity that we faced, all the, the circumstances that have been unpleasant become more possible for us to get through. And we forget that this is a weapon that God has given us. Pastor Jan said this so beautifully last week when he had the toothpick and, and the sword. Praise is our weapon. You see, and we sometimes only want to use praise as a defense force, as a defense means. And God is saying to us, and he's reminding us this morning, that we need to be on the offensive all the time. And that is with praise. You see, Satan, Lucifer, remember, was the worship leader in heaven. He headed up one-third of the angels. One-third. He was in charge of the worship team. That's why he understands how important praise is to you and to me. And often we don't see this. And it's when we in that Babylonian area where we want to quit, where we want to hang up the harps, that Satan says, go ahead, go do it. It's much better for you. Because he understands the power behind our praises. You see, it's our praises that shrink the problems, shrink the circumstantial situation that we find ourselves in. It's a weapon. And when we begin to worship, we begin to invade Satan's territory. Isn't that beautiful? Because you see, Satan, the Bible says he's roaming on this earth. There's principalities upon this earth. 
And God has given us this weapon to use in the most supernatural way. And we don't often use this. We would rather go and be defensive. Well, let's see, I'm going to take revenge. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to sort these Babylonians out. No, that was the consequences of their sin. What they should have done is said, God, we will still praise you in this situation. So whatever situation you're in this morning, I want you to allow the Holy Spirit just to minister into your heart and to remind you that praise is what is God is going to use to uplift you, to strengthen you. Remember, Nehemiah, Nehemiah says, the joy of the Lord is my what? Is my strength. So the joy of the Lord comes when we praise God. That's what's, that, that's what's so significant. Psalm 68 Verse 1 says the following. Listen to this. It says, let God arise. How does God arise? In our praises. Let God arise and let his enemies be scattered. Remember the passage of Pastor Young spoke on last week? Jehoshaphat? It didn't take the sword to defeat the enemy. It took praises to disperse the enemy, and the enemy sorted themselves out. It says, let those also who hate him flee before him. And then Psalm 22, and I love Psalm 22, one of my favorites. Verse 3 says, it's in the praises, it's in the yashab of Israel. In other words, in the praises of the church today, that God's throne is built. Do you see how important it is? When you start building God's throne in your home, in your business, when you start praising God, when you bring your staff together and say, listen, it's tough times. It's when you bring your family together and say it's difficult situations, but we're going to praise God. Because as soon as you praise God, not only does His throne come down, but you're building, you're giving God an address. Your praise gives God an address. There's an address. Come on, 76 Marcus Fontaine, Gulf Estate, there is an address there because there's praise there. So God's throne is found in those places where you give praise regardless of how you feel. Come on. You see, this is how God operates. He operates against our understanding. God, God's ways are different. That's what the Bible says. His ways are different. His works are different. So let's trust His ways. Because something's about to happen in your house. When your house becomes God's address because of your praise, something's about to happen. You see, as Lucifer headed up the worship, Every time, and this is why he hates you to praise and worship God, because every time you start praising God, you are redeeming the worship of heaven. Come on. You're taking his place. He hates it. And so I want to say to you this morning, let's get back to understanding how important praise is. You know, on Tuesday and Wednesday, I was in a place called Whipstadt. Anybody hear of a place called Whipstadt? You have Hopetown? Well, I got to whip start and I thought, Lieve Heere, mag hierdie mense on a whip? Because just to get there was nach, there is no road. But anyway, we had the most wonderful time. One of our TCN churches, Pastor Harriman, who by the way is Pastor Katinka's father. He runs the church in Whipstadt. And we got there and we just got to know them better. And he was sharing a story with me. He said to me, before he came into the ministry, they were farmers somewhere on the border of Lesotho. And um, there were a lot of terror attacks on farmers, in particular in that time. And he said they had no burglar proofing, no alarms, no security guards, just him and the family. And he said they would praise God and worship God and trust God. But every Sunday their farm was made available. He would lead the services. And all the farmers and the staff from farmers would come and gather together on his farm. And so when he heard from one of his staff that they were on the hit list, their farm was going to be attacked and their lives were going to come under attack too. He said, well, I'm not going to do anything else except continue to praise my God. And they did. And the night of the attack, all their plans were foiled. Because the staff that same night relayed to Pastor Edmund, they came running to Pastor Edmund, they said, these tours are here, and they didn't burn down the farm. They didn't destroy your lives. Because when they got to the farm, they saw angels, huge angels surround the whole of this house. Come on, imagine. You see, that's what happens when we praise God. We usher in angels. 
Because the angels, listen, praises. You see, that's why Lucifer's task was so important in heaven. It brought all the angels because the other two-thirds, one was used with Gabriel for messengers, and the other was used with Michael for going to war. And so everybody would come together. Come on. You see, when you and I praise God, when we praise God this morning, angels are ushered into this house. I remember Pastor Des and myself, and let me share this from my heart. When we were about to leave the denomination that we were part of before we started this church, we were going through a very difficult time because we'd become an embarrassment to the establishment, right? Because we were too charismatic for this denomination, and we were really going through a hard time. But we continued to praise God and believe God for a breakthrough. We didn't know what was still going to be done to us. And you know that the one night, I don't know what time it was, but it was around about midnight. The next moment I woke up. I've never had this particular experience again. But I had an angel stand in our bedroom whose head touched the ceiling. And we were still living in Monument Heights here. But this angel's glory shone like a bright light. Bright, bright, bright. And he was speaking to me. And I was, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> I was mortified. I lay there paralyzed, thinking, God, what is happening? And I couldn't wake Desra up. But the light eventually caused her to wake up. But as she woke up, so the light of this angel began to fade. And she said to me, she said, was that an angel in our room? What had happened? She said, what did he say? I said, I don't know. But did he speak to you? I said, yes, he spoke to me. I said, and he, she said to me, and you mean to say you can't remember? I said, no, I can't remember. I said, but I do remember it was a man. It wasn't a woman, because then I wouldn't have listened. <laughs> but it was a man, and he had a big sword, and he stood there. And this worried me eh? for days, for months. It worried me. And when the cookie hit the fan in this denomination, and they told me we have to leave, well, it was heartbreaking for us. But at the same time, I began to remember the words that the angel had spoken. You see, God sent an angel because there was an address. You see, praise gave God an address. And God could send that angel there to speak into our life. And it must have been Gabriel or one of his guys, eh? Because they're the messenger guys. And he spoke into my life. He actually strengthened us to endure what was about to happen. Now listen, I want to say to you this morning, the same thing happened with Paul and Silas. Angels turned up. Do you know that there are angels in this house this morning? Now the word warns us, you don't worship angels. But they're there. You see, that's what praise and worship does. It ushers in the supernatural. It ushers in God's messengers, God's warriors. It ushers in revelation. Now let, let me tell you this morning, when you start praising and worshiping God, you're going to get revelation. And where do I find this? I'm going to take you into the Old Testament today. We're going to go look at Genesis chapter 44. And we're going to look at Genesis chapter 45. Not the whole chapter, just parts. I see some of you are like, wow. But if you go to Genesis chapter 44, you read, and this is where the story is, and then I'm going to read it to you. The story paraphrased is as follows. Joseph had become too IC in Egypt. He was like the prime minister. And he had entertained his brothers on a previous occasion because, remember, there was a global famine. Can you imagine? And Egypt became the place of feeding. Can, can you think about that? A desert area becomes the place of provision. And people from all over the world were coming to Egypt for food because Joseph had done what God had called him to do. And then his brothers turn up the same guys that had sold him as a slave, the same guys that caused heartache to their father. They'd sold Joseph, but they didn't recognize Joseph. And you may say, well, why? He was about 17 when he was taken as a slave. And the Bible says 13 years later, so then he was about 30, that he was prime minister. So there couldn't have been that much of a change. 
But it was the regalia. It was the clothing that he was wearing as prime minister. They didn't recognize him. And Joseph, I think, was bent on a bit of revenge. Because what he does, he says, if you don't bring your youngest brother Benjamin to me, then I'm not going to give you any food. So, of course, they bring Benjamin. And what is it? He plants a, a golden goblet, most probably, in Benjamin's bag. So Benjamin's, Benjamin is accused of stealing one of the king's goblets. And then all of a sudden, Joseph's heart is changed from revenge to praise. You know what happens? Let me show you. You want to know? He got revelation. Have a look at this. Genesis 44, verse 18 to verse 22. Now watch this. Then Judah, say Judah. Judah means praise. Then Judah came near to him and said, Oh my Lord, please let your servant speak a word in my Lord's hearing. And do not let your anger burn against your servant, for you are even like Pharaoh. My Lord asked his servant, saying, Have you a father or a brother? And we said to my Lord, We have a father, an old man, and a child of his old age who is young. His brother is dead, and he is alone. He alone is left of his mother's children, and his father loves him. Then you said to your servants, Bring him down to me that I may set my eyes on him. And we said to my Lord, the lad cannot leave his father, for if he should leave his father, his father would die. Genesis 45. Then Joseph could not restrain himself before all those who stood by him. And he cried out, Make everyone go out from me. So no one stood with him while Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept aloud, and the Egyptians and the house of Pharaoh heard it. And Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Does my father still live? But his brothers could not answer him, for they were dismayed in his presence. And Joseph said to his brothers, Please come near to me. So they came near, and then he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. Let me take you back to Genesis chapter 44. Verse 18 says, Then Judah came forward. When praise steps up, revelation comes down. You see, Judah symbolically, prophetically is used here to remind us that every time we praise, every time we step up in praise, every time we step forward in praise, no, regardless of what the situation is, revelation will come down. The Bible says in this particular passage, Joseph was traumatized when he heard the story, his father's still alive, where he was going to take his younger brother to be his own and to leave his brothers without a brother, all of a sudden, his heart was broken. You see, when we praise God, you know what? We break God's heart. We touch God's heart. Every time you and I lift up a praise before God, God says, that's my boy. You, you didn't want to praise him because you were in that situation. You didn't want to praise him and worship him because you weren't feeling good. You didn't want to praise and worship him because your wife walked out on you. You didn't want to praise and worship me because your, bank, your, your business went bankrupt. That's what... That's what's happening. And God is saying to you and to me this morning, will you praise me regardless of the situation? Because we touch God's heart. We touch his heart. And then Joseph, in, chapter, in, in verse 4 of Genesis 45, what does he do? He reveals himself. You see, as soon as praise steps up, revelation comes down. When you touch God's heart, God will give you revelation. God will give you something that you're looking for. God will give you the comfort that you need. God will give you whatever it is that you need through your praises. You see, it took something. It took a, a young man called Benjamin to break his heart. It took Judah to step up and say, can I remind you of the situation that we find ourselves in? You see, you can praise God, but you can also remind Him of the situation that you're in. You'll touch God's heart. You'll break God's heart this morning. 
but God will give you revelation. Do I hear an amen here this morning? You see, we need to invade the devil's territory. Come on, the, the devil has taken too much of your territory, your family. And we blame God. What are we really doing? We're giving the devil credit. So you praise him regardless of what happens. For me, just to be here this morning, it's, it's, it's a case of discipline. God, I don't feel like, but you know what? I know there's breakthrough. Come on, I, I cannot preach things to you in this church if I haven't walked that journey. Come on. You see, honey, what shrinks our problems? It's praise. Let me give you some of the ways we can shrink our problems. You see, some of the benefits of praising God are all in the Bible. But we sometimes fail to see them. And number one is, if I can say this to you, praise magnifies God. You see, when you, when you start worshiping God and when you start praising God, it's like taking a magnifying glass and you're just enlarging God. And your problems just become smaller and smaller. Psalm 69 verse 30, bring this up so beautifully. Watch this. I will praise the name of God with a song. And I like the second verse. And will magnify him with thanksgiving. Come on, who needs to make God bigger? Come on, we often make our problems bigger. We talk about our problems all the time. And God is saying, Rochelle, stop talking about the problems. Talk about me. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. I love this God that we serve. Because he wants to be glorified. He wants to be seen as God. You see, the second thing is, when I start praising God, like it or not, my praise is going to usher in his presence. That's why I say praise is God's address. It becomes his address. And every time I praise him, I build a throne. Remember what I said, Psalm 22, verse 3? It's in the praises, it's in the yachab of Israel. God's throne is built. Wow. And I love that. Because you see, I want more. I want more of his presence. I know I can never escape his presence. Eddie, his presence is around me, it's above me. It's, Michael W. Smith sings that. His, his love, his presence is up, above me, below me, behind me, before me. But sometimes we're not always conscious of that. But it's when we praise God, all of a sudden his presence becomes more real. It becomes more tangible. I love that. You see, and then, what, you know what praise does? It begins to lift up my soul. Makes me feel good. Come on. Who of you sing in the bath or in the toilet or in the shower? I do. You may not like it. My neighbors may not like it. But God loves it. And you know what it does? It encourages me. I feel much better. You can say, really? The way you sing? But I do. I whistle. I whistle. It gets me through life. And you see, that's exactly what David is reminding us of. He says in Psalm 42, verses 5 to verse 6, the following, listen to this. Why are you cast down on my soul, and why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. Oh my God, my soul is cast down within me. Therefore I will remember you from the land of Jordan, and from the heights of Hermon, and from the hill Mizar. The psalmist is saying, come on, man, remember who, who your God is. I was in Israel in February with a group, and some of them were sitting here at the earlier service. And we were standing in the, in the very place that Jesus was imprisoned for the night before he was taken the next day to be tried. And it's a very emotional, it's a very emotional experience to have to be in this place. It's like what we would call a jojo tank. It's really a cistern. And when Jesus was tied around the waist and he was lowered through a hole, probably a little higher than what this ceiling is, but he was lowered into a little cistern. And he spent the night there in mud and water. We forget about that after he'd already been beaten and whipped and cussed. But you know what? How did Jesus lift up his soul? He had verses. And one of the verses that he most likely would have quoted is Psalm 121. 
And I'm standing with a group, and we've got a video clip of this. I'm standing with a group, and I'm ministering to them, and I'm reading that psalm to them. And I turned to Sharon, which is my Jewish guide, and I said to Sharon, can you sing this in Hebrew? She said, yes. And when you listen to this in a moment, you will hear how melodious this is. And this is the very song that I believe 99.9% that Jesus would have sung when they took him to Calvary. You see, he didn't have a Bible in his hand. But he had the word hidden in his heart. And that's the encouragement. He had the word hidden here, and he would sing it. Now listen to this video clip. Just sit back, watch it. So beautiful. You've got Psalm 121 in Hebrew. So in English it says, I will lift up my eyes to the hills, from whence comes my help. My help comes from the Lord, who made heaven and earth. And he will not allow your foot to be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve you from all evil. He shall preserve your soul. The Lord shall preserve your going out and your coming in. From this time forth and even forever. Come on, that's how Jesus encouraged himself. So when you leave, take a photograph where those doors of the church are. Because that's all Jesus had. There weren't any disciples around. Okay. Only the first two verses. Come on, Ivan. Where's Ivan and Ronell? They were with me. Just this year. That's a song that Jesus would have sung. In his condition, he knew the importance of praise. Why do we say it's that song? Because there are only that many ascent songs. And that one in particular speaks of going up. I lift up my, he- my eyes to the hills. That's the one most likely Jesus would have sung. To lift up his spirit. Can I say to you this morning, God is looking at your life right now, Reggie. He's looking at your life, Denzel. And he's saying, come on, I want you to lift up your spirit. I want you to hear what I'm saying. You see, God wants to give us revelation. But if our spirit is downcast, we don't receive what God is speaking to us. And that is why we need to lift up our spirit. We need to praise him. We need to to filter out all the negative things and say, God, let your will be done. You see, another thing that stands out for me is praise highlights God's blessings. It highlights God's benefits. You think of Psalm 103. It says, bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgives you of your iniquities. It's a beautiful psalm. It's a song. A song to remind you and me that he will even redeem my life from destruction. This is the very psalm that carried me through when I was buried in an avalanche on Mount Everest. That's the psalm that God gave me for weeks. And only when I was buried did I realize that's why God wanted me to memorize it. So that I would be able to cry and say, and you will redeem my life from destruction. Come on. It's praise. You've got to put it in your heart. But in the Hong Kong, but in your Bible, some of you at me. When you don't have a wife or a husband next to you to encourage you, God is saying, get it into your spirit. Forget not the benefits. Praise is revelational. Can you say revelational? You see, even the psalmist in this particular psalm says, and when I go into the place, the sanctuary, when I worship God, I'll hear and my understanding will improve. He says, until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I understood the means of God, the end. Praise enlists God's protection. 
Come on, come on, come on. I like this part. That's what Pastor Young did so beautifully on Sunday. King Jehoshaphat. Come on, don't you think Israel was protected from being massacred? How? Through praise. David writes a beautiful psalm, Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not. Come on, he speaks about protection. It's a song. I want to encourage you this morning that you walk out of this church and you say, yes, God, no matter what comes my way, no matter what the trials are, no matter what the tribulation is, I'm going to praise you regardless of who and what. Because God is going to rise. Amen? You see, it's praise that sets the captives free. Acts chapter 16 reminds us when Paul and Silas were imprisoned, what did they do? They sang songs. They praised God. Angels ushered in and chains came loose. And this morning God is saying, you praise me, I'll free you from that addiction. You praise me, I will give you revelation. You praise me, I will set you free. Come on. That's who our God is. He's a God who sets the captives free. And if I can close by saying to you this morning, we don't need to sit at the rivers of Babylon and weep. You can go and fetch your harp this morning. Come and tell your neighbor, I'm ready to fetch my harp. Tell your neighbor, I'm ready to redeem the worship for heaven.